know that the vaccine is safe for women of childbearing age. Many Long Islanders worried about the safety of the coronavirus vaccine. How come it took the vaccine only nine months to be made? Vaccinating the public, an increasingly partisan and political issue. Dr. Anthony Fauci, member of the White House Coronavirus Task Force, joining us now to answer your questions. Right now, a special event from the Newsday Studios, a conversation with Dr. Fauci. Thanks for joining us. I'm Faith Jesse. This is a chance for Long Islanders to get the information they need from the government's point person in the war against COVID-19. Dr. Fauci, who has been tapped to be the president-elect's chief medical advisor, joins us now. And thank you so much for being here with us. We know you have a very busy schedule, Dr. Fauci. That's good to be with you. Thank you for having me. Well, we're excited to get into these questions, but first I want to introduce my colleague also joining the conversation, Randy Marshall, a member of our editorial board who has been writing about the rollout of the vaccine for Newsday. Randy, why don't you start off with the first question? Thanks so much, Faith, and thank you, Dr. Fauci, for being with us today. Let's get right into this. More than 2,000 members of our audience have given us questions and told us that they want this vaccine, but they worry about its safety, they worry about the speed with which it was developed, or they worry about their medical conditions or allergies, or even fertility and pregnancy issues. How are you addressing those concerns and how will they be able to know whether or not the vaccine is safe in their individual circumstances? Well, the, you've asked a number of questions and there is a, a reasonable answer to each of those. I think the one that dominates is the question that people ask, which was the first one that you asked, is, is it safe because it was done so quickly to go from the first recognition that we're dealing with a new virus, in this case, that was January of 2020, to the fact that 11 months, less than a year later, you have vaccine that is already being administered in the month of December 2020 into people. And we're now in a full-blown vaccine campaign as we're into January of 2021. And the fact is that the speed is related purely to the spectacular advances that have been made in vaccine platform technology. There is no cutting corners and there's no compromise of safety, nor is there compromise of scientific integrity. It purely is a reflection of the spectacular advances that we've been made in the technology of vaccine development. In addition, the enormous amount of money measured in hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars, in making vaccine doses available as soon as the vaccine trial is over, as opposed to waiting until the vaccine trial is over and then starting to make the many doses of vaccine. So it was a financial risk, not a safety risk. In addition, the vaccine has been tested. Two companies now have vaccines that are available by an emergency use authorization, the Moderna product and the Pfizer product. The Moderna product had 30,000 people in the clinical trial, men, women, the elderly, and those with underlying conditions. The Pfizer trial was similar, but had 44,000 people in the trial. So we have a lot of information about the safety and efficacy in men, in women, in women who are uh, you know, of any age, and even those having underlying conditions. That makes a lot of sense to me. The interesting thing about the discussion of speed is that now it seems we're behind schedule and actually getting the shots into people's arms. Governor Cuomo actually said Monday that he's trying to make the state move faster with the rollout. Do you think the state has to be more aggressive and that states in general have to be more aggressive? And do you worry about the timetable and that we're going to be set back by the fact that we're slow to get vaccines into people's arms? You know, I think we have to be really careful, Randy, that we don't jump to a conclusion based on a very short time period because we just started the government and the locals, including the governors and the mayors and others, have just started in the last 
couple of weeks in December, right in the middle of the holiday season, in a brand new major vaccine program, you're always going to expect some bumps in the road and some glitches early on. And particularly since the slowness that you always see when you're in the holiday season, I think we should wait until the first and second week in January to see if we can catch up with the pace. But you're right, it got off to a slow start and we need to do better at every level. But I believe that we will pick up momentum as we get beyond the holiday season into the first couple of weeks in January. That makes a lot of sense to me as well. So the ultimate question that people are asking, however, is when will I be able to get the vaccine? When will I know it's my turn? Is there a plan to sort of, to, to be able to tell people, it'll be your turn in April, it'll be your turn in May, it'll be your turn in June. How, how do you give people some reassurance that their turn is coming and when that might happen? Well, the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices over many, many years has advised the CDC who makes the final determination when you have vaccines that are being rolled out and not everybody has the opportunity at the same time of what the priority is. And you know, the first round, what we call 1A priority, where healthcare providers who are putting themselves on the line, their safety, their health to take care of people with COVID-19, they, together with the occupants of nursing homes and the staff who take care of them, are in that first group. The second group are individuals 75 years of age or older and essential members of society who need to keep things running. The third and fourth groups will be announced sometime soon. So they will be public announcements that will easily be available through the public media or just go on the CDC website by going cdc.gov on your computer and you could get that information quickly. We hope that by the time we get to the end of March, the beginning of April, that we'll be at that point where the priority groups have already been vaccinated and it's what I would call open season. <laughs> Namely, anybody in society, you don't have to be in a particular priority group, but anybody can wind up getting vaccinated. And I think by the time we get to April, we will be at that point where a normal man or woman who has no underlying condition and no reason to be at a high risk can get vaccinated if they want to. Dr. Fauci, more recently, some public health experts have been saying that perhaps everyone should get one shot before they get their second, or that maybe even there should be half a dose instead of a full dose. What is your take on that? There really is no scientific basis in a clinical trial that proves that giving a dose to more people and maybe waiting instead of the 21 and 28 days that the science told us was the correct interval by going out two, three, maybe four months for the second dose. That is something that is taking a chance and we would prefer to make all of our decisions based on the scientific data that we have. So that's the question of giving more people one dose and waiting longer to give the second dose. There is not scientific data to back that up. It might work. I mean, I'm giving it the possibility that it might work, but we don't have good scientific data to prove that. The other question that you're asking is, what about a half a dose? Well, that's a little bit of a complicated story because <laughs> One of the companies, Moderna, in their phase two trial found that when they compared a 50 microgram dose with the full 100 microgram dose, namely a half dose, that in younger people between the age of 18 and 55, that the response that they were getting, namely the antibody level, was the same with the 50 microgram dose as it was for the 100 microgram dose. They feel that you might be able to get away with in younger people to actually use half the dose. Now, that's a proposal that would likely have to be put before the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, to determine if it's feasible to do that. 
But there is some scientific data behind that, namely the phase two trial that showed equivalency between the lower dose and the higher dose. Now, thank you so much for that, Dr. Fauci. We've received more than 2,000 questions from people who depend on Newsday to get their information about the virus. And many of these questions focus on what happens after the vaccine is administered. Here's one. If you get the shot, can you be an asymptomatic carrier with it? The answer is that is possible. We do not know for sure whether the vaccine protects you against initial infection. We're making the assumption since the primary endpoint of the trial was does it protect you from clinically recognizable disease? And the answer to that is an overwhelming yes. It's 94 to 95% efficacious in protecting you against symptomatic disease. We don't know for sure whether you can get infected, have virus in your nasopharynx, but not get symptoms. If that's the case, then we're not sure whether your vaccine is gonna protect you from getting it and then transmitting it to others. We will know the answer to that as we do further studies over the next few months. But right now, we cannot answer that question definitively, whether the vaccine prevents you from getting asymptomatic infection. So given that, Dr. Fauci, do you encourage people, whether vaccinated or not, but especially those vaccinated, to still wear masks, socially distance, follow the protocol, even if they're within a group of people who have already been vaccinated? Randy, the answer to that is yes. Uh, I think until we get the overwhelming majority, and I have used the number 70 to 85 percent of the population vaccinated, which would, which, would de- which would add a degree of herd immunity and bring the level of virus very, very low. Right now, as you know from the media, the reality that we have an extraordinarily large amount of virus in the community. We're averaging 200 plus thousand new cases a day and two to 3,000 deaths per day. So there's a lot of virus out there. So even if I get vaccinated, which I have been vaccinated, I need to wear a mask. When the society is totally protected, then you could back off a bit on the stringency of the public health measure. But until that time, we should continue to wear masks. So there's been a lot of talk about your recent comments on herd immunity. I wondered if you could clarify a little bit about where your thinking is at right now on herd immunity and whether it's going to be more difficult to achieve it, especially as some have been expressing doubts about the vaccine itself. Well, if people don't get vaccinated, Randy, you're not going to achieve the level of vaccination that's required for herd immunity. If you compare the amount of vaccination you need for herd immunity with measles, Measles is, is one of, if not the most contagious virus. SARS-CoV-2 is very contagious, but not as much as measles. In order to attain herd immunity, you have to get about 90 plus percent of the population vaccinated for protection for herd immunity for measles. Once you get below 90 into the 80s, you lose a certain amount of the herd immunity with measles. And so the reason why, and even though we have to say and be humble and modest, we don't know precisely 100% what the level of vaccination you need for herd immunity for COVID-19. However, you can make a guesstimate, an extrapolation by saying since COVID-19 is not as transmissible and contagious as measles. And since the vaccine is 94, 95%, but not 98% effective the way measles is, that the requirement for herd immunity would be somewhat less. Hmm. So I and many of my colleagues in public health feel that the range is likely between 70 and 85% of the population would need to be vaccinated in order to get herd immunity against COVID-19, full well knowing that we don't know for sure 
what that number is. We know what it is for measles because we have decades of experience with measles. And we know when the level of vaccination in the community gets below 90 into the 80s, we know you lose herd immunity. We don't know that yet with, with SARS-CoV-2, but we will know that in the future. Now, Dr. Fauci, reports of severe allergic reactions from this vaccine causing concern for some. Uh, one Newsday viewer asked, What do you do if you have side effects, if you have allergies? How do you deal with that medication? There have been some severe allergic reactions, mostly with the Pfizer product, but also with the Moderna product. And the recommendation is if you have a severe allergic response to any of the components of the vaccine that you should not get vaccinated. If you have a history of allergy, that does not mean that you can't get vaccinated. It means if you have a history of severe allergy, when you get vaccinated, you should get vaccinated in a facility that has the capability of treating an allergic reaction in the unusual event that you might have an allergic reaction. But if you look at the vaccines that have been administered so far, the 4 million vaccines, as well as the tens of thousands in the trial, this is not something that's common at all. It's an unusual event. But the way to be safe is that you should not avoid vaccination, but if you have an allergic tendency, you should get vaccinated in a place that can treat an allergic reaction. Here on Long Island, we have many residents who are what some might call anti-vax. They doubt the safety and the science behind vaccines in general, and this one specifically. They think that it's political in nature. How do you convey a message to them, gain their trust, and become the louder voice in the room when some of those other voices can be quite loud? Well, first of all, you've got to understand their skepticism and their concern, and don't be accusatory to them when you're trying to convince them, based on science, why they should get vaccinated. And step by step, you should go over each of the areas that bothers them. Well, one of them, I already told you about the explanation for why things went so quickly. The other concern and cause for skepticism is that how do we know it's safe and effective? Is this the government putting something over on us? Is this the company trying to make a lot of money? What's the, what's the real fact? Well, what you do is you go over how the safety and efficacy is actually determined. In the clinical trial that I mentioned, the 30,000 people in the Moderna trial and the 44,000 people in the Pfizer trial, the people who look at the data and determine if it's safe and effective are an independent group called the Data and Safety Monitoring Board. They are beholden not to the government, nor are they beholden to the pharmaceutical company. They are completely independent they have looked at the data and they've determined that in fact it is safe and it is highly efficacious now the decision of whether to approve it in an emergency use authorization rests with the fda so when the data are examined they're given to the company the company presents it to the fda and the career scientists not the politicians the career scientists, together with their own independent advisory committee, a committee again that has no responsibility to anyone but the public, that committee works with the FDA to make a decision whether one should make the vaccine available to the general public. And that committee has voted that the vaccine is safe and effective and should be given to the general public. So what, the, what people in Long Island and everywhere need to realize that these decisions are both transparent and independent. They're not done behind closed doors. Right. 
and they're not done by people with vested interests. I'm glad that you conveyed that message. I think that's an important one. Many people are hoping that somehow the vaccine will bring a chance for some degree of normalcy in 2021. Uh, a vacation, a wedding, you know, New Year's Eve being and Times Square being full of people next year, this year, excuse me. What's your realistic picture of how big gatherings could work as this year continues and how things could progress? Well, Randy, it gets back to the question about herd immunity and when we will get there. So if things go the way we plan and hope they do, and we start getting to vaccinate the general public, namely people who are not in a priority group, if we can start that in April and then very aggressively vaccinate people from April, May, June, July, and August, I would hope that by the time we get to the fall, of 2021, late September, October, November, that we will be able to approach a strong degree of normality. Maybe not 100% normal, but enough to get people to eat in restaurants, to be able to go to the theater, to be able to watch a sports event, to feel very comfortable with the schools. I believe if we do it right, we can do that this coming fall. Well, that would be lovely news. <laughs> Absolutely. Another big concern among those who sent us questions is their right to choose. Here's one reader's question. And Dr. Fauci, after this video, I'll have a follow up. Is the vaccine going to be mandatory? The viewer asking, is the vaccine going to be mandatory? And Dr. Fauci, during a recent interview with Newsweek, you said you believed it's possible vaccines might become mandatory to travel or to attend schools. How do you feel about that today? Well, one thing that we can be almost certain of that, just like any other vaccine, it is very unlikely that is going to be federally mandated, mainly from the federal government. There will be individual institutions. They can be hospitals. They can be workplaces. They can be schools where the authorities in charge of that say, that in order to participate in the activities of this institution, you have to get vaccinated. We do that already. And the reason we do that is, I mean, a good example, I'm a physician and I see patients at the National Institutes of Health Hospital, our clinical center. I need to get vaccinated every year with influenza and I have to show that I've been vaccinated with hepatitis B. If not, I'm not allowed to see patients. So we are already doing mandated vaccines under certain circumstances. As you know, in the public school systems, children cannot get into a school if they don't have certain vaccinations like measles, mumps, rubella, et cetera, et cetera. So there are already existing examples of the mandating of vaccination not federally, but at the local level. Are there certain circumstances, though, where you'd advise elected officials to do a mandate for certain populations or certain situations? Well, that would have to depend on the circulation, Randy. I'm not sure. If you give me an example, I could surmise on it, but I'm not, I don't would think- Would there be circumstances here in New York with Governor Cuomo, for instance, would there be certain circumstances under which you would be telling Governor Cuomo, you know what, you may need to consider mandating because we're not getting the level of herd immunity we need? I don't think that that would happen, Randy, because it is very, you know, the way our government runs, that we generally don't like to demand that a state does something. And, you know, the nature of our government, our society is a federalist, most of the time you leave a degree of independence and decision-making to the state and local authorities. So I don't think that that would occur, but you know, you never know. I don't control that. I'm just giving you my opinion. Dr. Fauci, our next question comes from Betty Aboff from West Hempstead. She asked, is there a difference between the vaccines? Is one better than the other? Easy question. The answer is there's no difference. They're the same platform. They're both messenger RNA. And interestingly, their degree of efficacy is almost exactly the same, 94 to 95% efficacious. So there really is no difference. It doesn't matter which one you get. They're equally as good. 
is the best way to reach and vaccinate communities who are underserved? Those without the health systems, the pharmacies, the hospitals or other health, health facilities that, that really do need this vaccine and, and may have more trouble getting it? Great question, Randy. And that's the reason why you've got to put an extra effort to reach out to communities, particularly vulnerable communities, as you say, that don't have as easy access to healthcare facilities where they can easily get the vaccine. So it is the responsibility at the local level, local health authorities, city authorities, and even state authorities to provide for the outreach to those individuals to make sure that there's equitable distribution of vaccine, not just for those who are living in a certain state. Uh, when I say state, I mean condition <laughs> of wealth or otherwise that they can easily get vaccinated. It should be quite equivalent. So that is real uh, a fairness in the distribution of vaccine. And Dr. Fauci, we wanna thank you so much for joining us here at Newsday. There was so much valuable information and we appreciate you answering our questions about the vaccine and its importance before you have to run off to, I'm sure your schedule is packed. <laughs> Thank you, Faith. It's really be good. good to be with you. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk to the people of Long Island. Well, we really do appreciate it. And to all of our viewers, we know there are many questions from the audience that we weren't able to address. First, we want to thank you for all of those questions. We got an overwhelming response. Uh, and we will be holding a series of webinars where local health experts will be providing answers to those questions. In addition, Newsday is also providing COVID-19 updates via text. Here's what you got to do. Just go to newsday.com slash text and register so you can get up to the information. For all of us here at Newsday, I'm Faith Jesse, and thank you for watching.